It's a pleasure to be <clears throat> here on Berkeley campus again, a place with so much uh, amazing intellectual exploration across so many uh, disciplines. So I'm going to try to at least partially leave, live up to that as much as my brain can muster at, at, at nine in the morning and go, go, through a, go through a number of different topics and areas re relating to the question of what Francis and I in, in the 90s were, were discussing as the emerging global brain, the uh, notion of an intelligence of which we are parts and all of these devices we carry around are parts and computing and communication net networks are, 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 are parts and which surrounds the, the surface of, of, of the globe, even going a bit into space and, and on, under the earth at, at, at this point, and which seems to have some sort of emergent intelligence, maybe some sort of emergent awareness even. And I, I'm, I'm going to look at a few different perspectives on this notion of an emergent global brain. And of course, the global brain is a metaphor, I mean, the global brain is not really the same thing in detail as these three pounds of, uh, of fiber cells in, in, in our heads, but it's, uh, it, it remains a term that, that uh, speaks to me reasonably well. I think the, the noosphere, obviously, which uh, gives the name to, to this event, is certainly a, certainly a very closely related concept and none of these terms are 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 perfect i i, I think that the the spiritual aspect of the no sphere concept is perfectly apropos because i mean the, the spirit such as it is 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 connected to consciousness which is connected to mind i mean i mean i sort of see all this as 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 one continuum of of fascinating and, and confusing topics. I'm, I'm definitely not motivated by the Christian theology and, and spirituality side of it, but when, when, when I get toward the, the end of my 40 minutes uh, of disquisition up here before some, some q and I, I will say a bit about how I think the more computational and cognitive aspects of, of, of a global brain connect with, with more, uh, more spiritual aspects. But to get started, I want to shift from brain to mind. And of course, they're, they're closely related, at least relative to the physical universe we're in now, minds seem to be associated with physical systems from, wh from which these, these minds emerge, right? And minds have multiple different aspects one of these is experience or consciousness, which is something that, that modern science is only beginning to grapple with. I mean, when I started my science career, when I got my PhD in the 1980s, you almost couldn't talk about consciousness in a serious scientific venue. Sort of like you couldn't talk about artificial general intelligence in a serious scientific venue. Then in the 90s, we started to see more and more journals treating consciousness in, 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 a, in a serious way. And AGI took, took a little longer, but it, and, and now has is, is, uh, been brought into the <clears throat> mainstream of, of, of science and industry. But even though consciousness can now be discussed in, uh, in polite company, I, I, I would say we haven't made too much headway on understanding it. And I mean, we don't have to thoroughly understand something to do a lot with it. Like, we don't understand time very well. We can deal with special relativity and quantum mechanics, and we still don't fundamentally know, like, what is time, right? How does subjective time relate to physical time? So, I mean, a thorough understanding, it's, it's fine if that's always off in the distance and you're converging there. That's sort of how science works. But it seems like with consciousness, we're, we haven't converged. We haven't converged very far, right? Which, which means that when we have a question like, okay, could some sort of 
global brain, the global information processing matrix, you know, could that be conscious? We don't, we don't really have an accepted, grounded way to, to address a, a, a question like that. Because we don't even have a good way to address the question of whether, like a humanoid robot, like the, the Sophia robot whose, whose software I built, you know, she was made a citizen of Saudi Arabia at one point, whatever that may mean. But I, I mean, but we don't have a good way to address whether she's conscious or not, right? Because, I mean, intelligence is hard too, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, but at least we have, we have a start, right? For consciousness, it's, there are foundational issues people are, are still debating. And David Chalmers famously articulated what he called the hard problem of consciousness, which is how do you connect the feel of subjective experience with observed dynamics in, in a physical or computational system, what, what you could call the correlates of experience, neural or, or computational correlates of conscious experience. But of course, from some philosophical views, the hard problem is, is a, is a, is a non-problem because one view is you shouldn't try to reduce these two things. They're, ju they're, just, they're just different levels, which is, which is, which is fine, right? So my, my general approach to consciousness is to simplify the problem by assuming everything is conscious in its own special way, which is a, which is a philosophical approach known as panpsychism. And this is, in essence, the belief of the vast majority of world population. I, I mean, I lived in China for 10 years, and this is sort of just ambient to Chinese culture that awareness is in, in everything. And it's kind of ambient in Indian and African culture. So really the educated populations in, <clears throat> in the West is, is where you have on the planet right now, a concentration of people who think about it very differently than that. Like there's only certain physical systems that are associated with conscious experience and, and everything else isn't. For those who haven't looked into this area, the analytical philosopher Galen Strawson has written a bunch on this. He's, he's wrote a book called something like Physicalism uh, Entails Panpsychism. So he's trying to give these analytical philosophy arguments that if you believe everything is physical, you should believe everything is conscious. And he tries to prove the opposing point of view is, is incoherent. I don't want to go too deeply here. And I don't believe everything is physical anyway, so his argument only goes a certain distance for me. But if we if we take panpsychism as a at least hypothetical premise, then then you have the idea that okay, a mouse is conscious, my fingernail is conscious, maybe just a little bit though. Like they have a different form of consciousness than I have. They may have less intense consciousness than I have. Sophia, the robot, right now certainly is not conscious of everything she's saying or how she's reacting in the sense that, that I am. And I'm not, I'm not always conscious of everything I'm saying either, right? So, so, and something like a global brain is quite different than us. What kind of conscious experience it would have is really not very clear, even if you set aside this sort of sophomoric thing of does it have experience or not, like how to conceptualize or frame the kind of experience a system like this would feel is is really quite interesting, and I'll, I'll come back to that in more depth in in, in, a, in a few moments. But I mean, the consciousness of human beings obviously it has a lot to do with our with our bodies, right? Like I, I mean, we, we we grow up in physical bodies. We as a baby, we can't quite distinguish ourselves from the physical world around around, around us, even. I mean, and the sense of of touch, the sense of kinesthesia. All this is really critical to our consciousness and the touch of, of other people is as a sort of second person experience, which is critical for the development of a, of, a, of a young mind. We're then concerned with, you know, moving these bodies around, making sure they survive, make, make, making them, them reproduce. And this leads to a style of consciousness, which is very focused on the self, right? On, on mo mo modeling the individual self and it's, it's focused on will in the sense that this body has to choose to go here or, 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 to, or to go there, right? And we're, I mean, we happen to be 
in an environment mostly of solid objects. We're not like in the gas clouds of Jupiter and solid objects are somewhat binary in their configuration. Like you move it from here, from here to there, right? They're, they're different than, than fluids or gases. So all these basic facts of our embodied existence give us a certain style of conscious experience, which is self-centered, both in good and bad senses, right? I mean, it's sort of what we had to do to survive. And then if you, if you follow various spiritual paths, you go through a journey to feel more oceanic and connected with the, with the world around you and, and to, to not have a consciousness so centered on a model of yourself, you can come to perceive what used to be yourself as a sort of cluster of behavior patterns that are closely coupled with, with what's happening outside your body and in, in, in the world around you. One might think that something like a global brain in some ways could be more like that to begin with. Like it doesn't have, it doesn't have a body that it has to <clears throat> control. It's not exactly having to fight for survival in reproduction in the, in the way that, 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 that animals were. It is, in spite of big tech companies and government hegemonies and so forth, it's less centralized than the human brain with, with, with its uh, autonomic nervous system and so forth. So you're, it would seem looking at a more diffuse form of, of, of consciousness. So maybe the global brain is just really stoned all the time and just like drifting around from, from one, one thought to another. But that, I mean, but that, that's, that's also a bad metaphor. And often it seems to be on a much worse form of drug trip than that also if we, if, if, if we want to pursue, pursue that, 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 that sort of metaphor. And you can then, going beyond consciousness, you can try to look at what's the structure of mind as, 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 as such, as a sort of cognitive processing entity, and how would that apply on the global brain level? I mean, one way to look at much of what a mind does is that a mind is a set of patterns in or associated with a certain physical system. And this system of patterns is heavily concerned with recognizing patterns in that system's own dynamics and structure and in the environment of that system. Among those patterns are patterns regarding which actions, if taken by the, that physical system, in, in which environments, in which situations will achieve which goals, right? So you're recognizing a lot of patterns in yourself and the world. Among these are patterns involving doing what will, will, will cause what effects effects to to happen and it's a hard problem and it relies on having many kinds of memory because if you had an environment that was randomly changing all the time there'd be no patterns to recognize we have an environment which changes randomly a bit but there's a lot of persistence of, of pattern also right so we develop episodic memory of life history declarative memory of facts and beliefs procedural memory of how to do stuff and then learning and reasoning mechanisms tied to these different sorts of memory, then the learning and reasoning mechanisms associated with different sorts of memory have to work together cooperatively to get, you know, processing done and action selection done eff efficiently, given, given the energetic limitations of the, of, the, of the body and the fact that the body has to do stuff on a certain time schedule. So that, then how would all this pan out in a global brain context? Like what kinds of memory does a global brain have what kind of learn what kinds of learning and and reasoning that does it does it have and th these are certainly quite interesting questions and i'm not sure that i know the answers to these and, I, and so going going back to francis's initial remarks so yeah we we met sometime in the mid 90s and our intersection was related to the fact that we were both writing and talking about this notion of a global brain in, in, independently, I mean, al along with a few others at, 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 that, at that time. And we have here, I guess, uh, Cliff Jocelyn, who, who was writing and thinking about these things at, at the same time, who was, was a, I was a close collaborator with, with. We were also working with uh, Valentin Turchin, who was pretty much the, the founder of, of 
Russian AI as, 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 as well as a deep thinker about global brain cybernetics and all sorts of other related things. He, he passed away, I guess, a decade and a half ago or, or, or something, but we organized in 2001 an event at the Free University of, of Brussels, where Francis was and, and, and still is, we organized an event which we called the Global Brain Workshop, or colloquially, I was referring to it as Global Brain Zero. And we were, we were planning on having a Global Brain One conference. Actually, we were scheming a bit to do Global Brain One in 2021, like 10 years after, 20 years after the first one, but then COVID happened. I mean, we could have done it online, but it was, would have been more fun to do it all together. So th this event, almost like that, it's not quite Global Brain One, but it's, it's, uh, it's quite close in theme. And if, if I go back to some of what we discussed at that Global Brain Workshop in, in 2001, I find that most of the key issues that we raised there are pretty much just as unresolved as they, as they were at that, at, that, at that point in time, at least in as, in as much as I'm, I'm currently aware. So it became clear after a few days of that workshop, there were a number of very different ways of, of thinking about the global brain. The one was, it's already here. It's been here since the invention of the telegraph or however far, maybe it was here even before that, just with very slow thinking, like a tree in forest, a very slow thinking compared to us, right? So one way of thinking about it is global brain is here already, getting smarter all the time. We just don't understand it very well, any more than the neurons in our brain, which have their own lives and, and doings and pursuits and maybe feelings if you're panpsychist, any more than the neurons in, in our brain understand you know, what the whole brain is thinking about or, or doing at any one time. So that point of view is like, hey, the global brain is here. It's just we're neurons in the global brain and it's thinking stuff that's totally on a different level and incomprehensible to us, right? So another way of thinking is the global brain will emerge. It will pop up without anyone having to understand what the global brain is or trying to build one. The global brain will emerge but it hasn't emerged big time yet. It's currently only in a little like preliminary inkling form. It looks, once we have better AI systems and, and faster internet connections and maybe maybe some uh, brain chips or whatever the threshold thing is, like at, at some point, at some point, you'll get the full on global brain, which will have some much more coherent intelligence at, at the global level. And we'll be able to feel, feel the difference there, even if we can't understand all its thoughts. Then, Another perspective on all this was, well, the global brain is something, it's not inevitable, but we have to engineer, or at least nudge and coax intentionally. So that point of view would be the activity in the computing and communication and biological systems on the Earth's surface, the activity is going to be sort of chaotic and haphazard and screwball. But then if you architect the right mechanisms, you could cause it to cohere more and become more of a, a real a real global brain. So you can contrast a brain which has not just neurons haphazardly connected, but a particular cognitive architecture versus what you would get if you haphazardly just strung a bunch of neurons together into a mess, right? And then in a way that's a brain, but it's a really dumb brain and it probably doesn't have a very coherent stream, stream, of, stream of, of, of experience, right? So the view, these views were then it's already been here a while. It's going to pop up soon. Or if we want it, we, we, we've got to make it, right? And all those, all those perspectives and others, but these were some big ones. All these perspectives were represented at the, this Global Brain Workshop we held in 2001. And we also had the question, like, how would you measure intelligence in the global brain or consciousness or coherent thinking or you know, goal, pursuit, whatever quality you want, how would you actually measure that in, in, in the global brain? And we didn't have a terribly good answer to that too. I mean, you come down to the fact we don't know how to measure intelligence in humans right, right, right now very well, right? So then, then, let alone across biological species even, like how is a dolphin smarter than a chimp, right? So, so I mean, now we're looking at it 
very, very different sort of cognitive organism. And we don't have, let alone a practical test, we don't have a well-accepted theoretical framework for measuring the in intelligence of, 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 this, of this sort of thing. But I want to talk a little bit about that now. This has been a topic I've returned to recently just because we have so much more data about what's happening in the computing and, and communication systems around the world. Now we have so much more data than, than, than we used to that, you know, it might be more feasible to make a stab at, at measuring what's happening in the global brain as it emerges. If we tried a little harder to conceptualize what it is we want to measure, right? So what is intelligence? Well, there's a mathematical theory of general intelligence, which I don't fully buy, but I think it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, so this is developed largely by Marcus Hooter in, in the, at, when he was at IDSIA University in, in Switzerland. Now he was at Australian National University for a while. Now he's in Google DeepMind, actually. But his PhD student, Shane Legg, who went on, who worked for me in the 1990s, then went on to found Google DeepMind. So Shane's PhD thesis tried to crystallize a formal definition of general intelligence, which is roughly like the ability to achieve arbitrary computable reward functions in arbitrary environments. So if you want to gloss that less, less mathematically, it's like a general intelligence should be able to achieve any goal in any environment, right? And of course, that's impossible as, as such. And then it comes into how do you weight the goals and environments? So it, then it becomes like on average, on the average overall goals and environments, how well can you achieve the average goal in the average environment? And then what kind of weighted average do you use becomes the question. And this is where the math comes in. There's, there's something called the Salamanoff Levin measure, the Salamanoff prior that gives you a way to put a weight over all possible goals or environments where the simpler ones in some sense are more probable, the more complex ones are less probable. So you use this weighting by simplicity of goals and environments and you say, based on this weighting, how is the system's weighted average ability to achieve goals over environments? You can prove a lot of theorems about that. In the end, it's probably not too useful except conceptually. One thing, one problem is the way you weight goals and environments by simplicity depends on an assumption of what computing machine you're using to assess simplicity. Like the, the basic way to tell how simple something is in this context is if it's described by a short computer program. But that depends what computer architecture you're running it on. So there's some <clears throat> wiggle room there which doesn't matter in, in the math, but can matter in, 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 in practice. There's also the fact that humans are really, really dumb by this measure, right? Like we're all bad at achieving arbitrary reward functions in, in arbitrary environments. We're not even good at like seducing people in the world or, 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 or like uh, doing a maze or, or, or not getting fired from our, from, from our jobs or finding our way in a city with, with that, with, without a GPS system, let alone... <coughs> running a maze in 750 dimensions or, or proving a randomly generated mathematics theorem, right? So we're just, or juggling, say, right? I, I mean, I, mean I, I think I can juggle two balls. I might have forgotten three. But, um, I mean, so we're, we're bad at a lot of quite simple goals. So we're kind of dumb by this measure of general intelligence, right? There's also the issue that achieving goals to get rewards is not really the crux of, of human life, right? I mean, it's a thing that we do for some periods of time and then we stop doing it. I mean, not all of what I do. I'm, I'm actually a probably much more goal-driven person than most people I know, but a lot of what I do is not goal-driven, right? And, and of course, as your brain develops and as you evolve in your life, you might throw out your old goals and take, take on some new goals. So it seems more like pursuing goals it is something that we do, it's important that we can do it, but it's coupled with a lot of other self-organizing dynamics. It's not like looking at us as reward maximizers as the basic thing we do is, is a valid model of, of 
human-like general intelligence or, or animal general intelligence. It is, it's a nice abstraction to have. It tells you something. This leads on to the work of uh, Weaver, who was a PG student of uh, Francis Heligan uh, some years ago, who wrote a PG thesis called <laughs> Open-Ended Intelligence. And Weaver was trying to come up with just a different way of semi-formally conceptualizing what general intelligence is, throw out all this stuff with reward functions, look more at complex self-organizing biological systems. And I mean, his perspective is subtle and you should read his paper or, or book or thesis on open-ended intelligence. But to, to highlight one aspect of it, he's looking at an intelligence system as a self-organizing complex, autopoietic meaning self-constructing system which is governed by two sort of primary metadynamics, both of which are drawn largely from continental philosophy, from De Deleuze and all this. So one of these is individuation, like an intelligent system should maintain its boundaries and continue its own existence as, as, as a system. And what that, that's not really tied to being physical even, it's more just can it be identified as a persistent thing that, that keeps itself going over, over, over time as, as a persistent, even if changing pattern, right? And then the other part beyond individuation is self-transcendence or self-transformation. Like is, is this thing which is maintaining its boundaries and metabolizing in a direct or, or metaphorical sense, is this thing which is maintaining its boundaries, is it also growing beyond itself so that it's pushing so that its next state will be something its previous state had no clue about and, and couldn't understand and going beyond its own, its own limitation. So he's just figuring intelligence is about individuation and self-transcendence. And there's, there's a dialectic between these, right? And you see, we see this in our own lives all the time. This, but it's just like, it's a form of risk reward balance, right? I mean, to, clearly all the time in our lives, we see, we have a choice. Do we self-transcend in a way that risks our individuation and our, our destruction? Or, or, or do we, you know, deny taking that rapid leap in, into the future so that we know we can survive to try different leaps later on, right? So this dialectic is there and is, is part of what drives, drives the uh, intelligent system forward. Now, you can see that a, a complex self-organizing system, which is individuating and, and self-transcending, you can see this is, it's often going to be implicitly pursuing goals, but it's also often going to be positing goals and then, and then chasing after them. But the goals that are meaningful at each stage in its development are going to be, are going to be different, right? And I think, I think we see that in our own lives also, right? Like the goals I was pursuing as a teenager, I was interested in AGI back then. I mean, there, and I was also interested in like, eating and staying alive back then. So there, there, there certainly was correlation, but there, there, there's very different goals also. And it's not important that my current self is good at, at achieving the goals that were important to my teenage self, right? It, it's not important that at each stage, I'm actually equally good at achieving, achieving, achieving everything. What's important is to be good enough at achieving the goals that pop up as being relevant to the individuation and self-transformation that you need to do as an organism at that stage in your in your in your development, right? So that's interesting way to look at general intelligence. Humans are not so good at that either, but probably better than we are at achieving arbitrary reward functions in arbitrary environments, right? On, on the other hand, this doesn't give you too much in terms of a quantitative way to, to measure different systems because it's very, very high level. Now, measuring human intelligence, I mean, there's IQ tests, which don't really work cross-culturally even. There's, you know, Gardner's multiple intelligences, which probably works better cross-culturally, but it's still tied to human beings, right? I mean, I mean like, you have musical intelligence, doesn't mean much for an organism without ears or something, right? So th these are very hum human-specific things. And I would say designing valid, even roughly valid, cross-species intelligence tests is an interesting thing to do, both for measuring intelligence of the emerging global brain and for measuring intelligence of would-be AGI systems that, that we build in, in, in a robot or, or a computer system now. 
I don't think it's important to come up with one number saying this is how intelligent this, this system is. It's, of course, it's not going to be like that. But it will be quite interesting to have an array of, of meaningful indicators to, 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 to measure, right? And I, I think uh, one could make a stab at that. It's just not something the scientific community has, has, has cared about much, right? So if you look at how might you measure the state of the global brain in a way that's relevant to consciousness and intelligence. I mean, you have Tononi phi coefficient, which is, is very far from a necessary and sufficient condition for consciousness, as it's sometimes been put forward as. But I think it's a, it's a decent measure of the amount of sort of a emergent information in, in, a, in, a, in a, an overall system. It will, you know, people have a higher Tononi phi when they're awake than when they're asleep. We showed Sophia Robot had a higher Tononi phi in the OpenCog AI system behind her when she was reading a complex text and when she's reading a simple text than when, than when she's just not doing much of anything. So you have measurements like phi that tell you what's the amount of sort of emergent pattern emergent information in the whole system, the pattern in the whole above the sum of the pattern in, in the parts. And it'll be interesting to measure stuff like that in the global brain right now. I mean, you can see there's some ways in which the global brain is becoming more unified now. Certainly like the scientific community goes back and forth faster and faster. There's some ways in which it's becoming more, se more separate now, like China and Russia are more cut off from, from the West. It'll be interesting to see how this combination of convergence and separation pans out in different mathematical measures of, of information and pattern flow across the globe. Not because you're going to come up with one number, but you might have multiple numbers measuring this in, in, in different ways. I think you could also ask what goals is the system implicitly pursuing? And I mean, this is a harder data mining problem, but not, not impossible. Like you say, what, what, what are the reward functions that over a certain period of time this system would be well modeled as if it was chasing that reward function, right? And, and looking at what's happening in, in, in the world that way could be quite interesting. I mean, you, you can have some systems that look like they're pursuing their own destruction, right? I mean, you can have some systems that, that do look like they're pursuing self-transcendence, some that look like they're just trying to, you know, fortify their barriers against, against everything else, some that look like they're trying to learn how some other system is operating or something, right? So looking at what goals are implicitly being pursued by different subsystems would be an interesting thing. I think you could also try to measure open-ended intelligence a la Weaver so, so, somehow or other. So, I, I mean, I think you could, you could look for subsystems in the global brain that are evidently individuating. They're carrying out dynamics to preserve their boundaries. And you could ask among these subsystems, which ones seem to be self-transcending, which systems, say, which communities of people or which bodies of, of knowledge that are cross-linked are not just retaining themselves as an identifiable coherent body of knowledge, but are then growing more and more com com complexity and, and gaining, gaining new features that, that weren't derivable from the features they had before, right? So you, can, you could look at all the data of what's happening on the internet and see to what extent do we have subsystems that, that are actually evolving as, as open-ended intelligences, right? And this this will be quite interesting. I mean, the data curation problem will be a big pain. Like, if, if we had access to all data of everything happening on the global internet, you could, with a supercomputer, you could actually measure these things that I'm, that I'm describing. I mean, in reality, Chinese Communist Party isn't giving us all the WeChat transcripts of the Chinese population, and uh, I mean, I mean, you you have Twitter, which you could get if if Elon Musk wants to give you the full archive, and th th I mean, things are trapped within within proprietary firewall data stores. But there is some data that's public, and I think we can make a better a better stab at measuring this sort of thing than 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 we than we have been. So in the in the last five minutes of the talk, I want to talk a bit about the quest to build artificial general intelligence, not in the emerging global brain, but in specific computer systems running on you know, networks of, of, of server farms. This is what I've been spending most of my time on for quite some time. I'm mostly just going to allude and give pointers to the things I've been working on because I don't have much time. 
But what I want to indicate is why I think this could be important for the global brain. Because I, I do think there is some form of global brain right now that we don't understand well. I also think the intelligence coherence of this global brain is going to get more and more intensive in the next five or 10 years even as, as AI and computing networks, communication networks flourish and grow. I, I also think that by explicitly nudging the global computing and communication network in, in, in the right way, we can probably make a smarter and, and better global brain em emerge. So, you know, we're familiar with recent progress in AI like ChatGPT and other, other large language models. I had a 90 page paper or something on archive.org I posted recently looking into what I think are the strengths and weaknesses of these sorts of systems. They're not human level general intelligences. I don't think they can be incrementally evolved into human level general intelligences. I do think they can be components of general intelligences. So I, th I think they're quite useful. And for example, I'm working now on using LLMs to translate all the text on the internet into structured logic format that we can then feed into logic engines to reason about. And I didn't previously have a machine that could translate English into logic, right? So that, that's cool. I mean, there, there's a lot of things these tools can do. They, they can be a sort of oracle of human knowledge to feed into a system which has more of a cognitive architecture than, than they do. But I, I think there are several approaches that could lead to human level general intelligence that people are pursuing right right now. I mean, one, one is actually trying to simulate the human brain better, like computational neuroscience is, is ad advancing greatly, although only loosely connected with deep neural nets, like the ones behind ChatGPT. Another that I've been discussing with uh, Francis l l last night is self-organizing artificial life slash artificial chemistry systems that we can run on distributed computers with, with much greater scale than ever before, just like populations of little rewrite rules that rewrite other rewrite rules, chemical reactions that react with other reactions, and you can coax them into forming interesting structures. And I think this is stuff that was done in the artificial life field decades ago, but we just didn't have enough compute firepower to really, to really see what would crystallize and self-organize out of this sort of system. But then that, that final approach is what I'm doing in my OpenCog project and the new version that we're building of the legacy OpenCog AI platform called OpenCog Hyperon. And you can, you can look up OpenCog Hyperon online, find out about that as well. I had a long paper on archive.org posted on that recently. And there, there's been a bunch of, of videos where, where I talk about, about OpenCog. But basically there we have a, knowledge metagraph so this big knowledge graph that who who it represents logical knowledge it represents programmatic knowledge procedures for doing things it represents perceptual knowledge but this this knowledge graph is dynamic and it's mostly concerned with modifying itself and recognizing pattern patterns in itself so you have this self-modifying self-reprogramming sort of knowledge metagraph which is the open cog atom space. And then this, this rather than something like a large language model is the hub. And things like an LLM or a convolutional neural net for perception or logical theory improver, they're in the periphery and they feed into this self-modifying knowledge graph. So this, this self-organizing autopoietic self-modifying knowledge graph that's more like an open-ended intelligence a la Weaver, but we're not trying to get that to do everything on its own. We're giving a bunch of other more narrowly constructed AI systems to, to consult and use it as, as oracles in, in, in evolving itself. And I think that what's cool is we have such fast computers now and so much data now and so many computer networks now, you can explore things like this and it all goes way, way faster than, than it, did, it did 10 or 15 years ago. So I'm I'm out of time, but I'm going to impose and take like like two more minutes anyway, because I want to connect this work on AGI back to the global the global brain theme, and this this has to do 
partly with what I'm doing in the Singularity Net project and some associated projects such as HyperCycle, which is a ledgerless blockchain, and NuNet, which is run by Kabir and Weaver, Francis's former PhD students, which is looking at how do you get a decentralized network of computers to share processing power to, to fuel, a, to fuel a, a distributed decentralized AI network. So these projects, Singularity Net, HyperCycle, and NuNet, these are aimed at not implementing any particular AGI approach like OpenCog Hyperon with our self-evolving Metagraph. These are aimed at enabling an AI system to run on a distributed network of computers around the globe without any central owner or controller. So if you, if, if you, if you look at something like what Google or OpenAI or Facebook is doing, these are distributed systems, right? They run across a whole bunch of servers, but the servers are owned and controlled by one central party, right? And if you look how Bitcoin or Ethereum works, these are, these are distributed financial instruments. There's no one owner or controller. It, it's just kind of self-organizingly run by all the different computers in, in that network. So we would like to make it so you can <clears throat> you could roll out an AI system that's running on a million different computers all around the world. And anyone who wants can put a machine online and it joins this, it joins this network, but there's no central owner or controller of that network. And you, you can find that a very frightening idea if you're afraid of, of AI becoming the Terminator or something or terrorists taking it over, or you could find that a very beneficial idea if you're afraid of big corporations and governments controlling the, the AI future and you'd rather have it done in a more decentralized and, and democratic way. So Singularity Net and its partner projects are, are aimed, at, aimed at making a decentralized infrastructure so that you can sort of splay out AI or AGI processing across more and more of the, of the global brain in a hardware implementation sense. But the final thing to think about then, and I'll pose this mostly as, as, as a question to not take up too much more time. The main thing, to th the final question I want to think about is, suppose we have an AI system getting smarter and smarter, say a little bit, say smarter than chat GPT, more knowledge of its own self and sense, but not yet, not yet full human level AGI. Suppose this is rolled out on millions of computers around the world with no central owner or controller. What could this distributed decentralized proto-AGI network, which say it can answer questions, analyze data and so forth, what could this do so as to help cause the emergence of a more intelligent, more coherent and more, more beneficial global brain? Like what, 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 as the neurons in the global brain, what do we want this distributed AI system to do? So like maybe, maybe a distributed decentralized AI system, say combining OpenCog Hyperon with neural nets, maybe this can serve as the sort of cognitive cortex of an emerging global brain, right? Now, not, not, that, not that you're gonna build the whole global brain, it has to emerge, it has to self-organize, but maybe putting a distributed decentralized proto-AGI system out there across server farms running in many different countries in many different places, like may, maybe this can seed the crystallization of a more interesting and more intelligent global brain. But what, what, what should this then look like, right? Is this, is this doing moderation on o open source social networks? Is it writing science papers and code and posting it in archive and, and, and GitHub and asking people to take up and, and modify on it? Is, it? is it analyzing patterns in the global brain itself and writing reports and making videos on these patterns and pushing them out for people to see. Like what, 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 what could a distributed decentralized proto-AGI system actually do to trigger the formation of, of a smarter global brain? And, and how is the consciousness of the human beings in the network play, playing, playing, it, playing into this, right? Because, I mean, you, you can see that centralized corporate AI networks like Facebook and Twitter and WeChat and so forth they direct human consciousness in, in, in a certain way. Like they, they polarize and tribalize things. They make you obsessed with buying the next thing that, that's put there in an ad for you to click on. So what, what sort of human consciousness growth and expansion could, you know, a decentralized AI network operated by a decentralized network of, of human beings, you know, what, what could this do to help sort of uplift human consciousness in a way that's correlated with driving the, the emergence of a, of, a, of a 
more coherent and more intelligent global brain. And we, we don't have a good way to address this sort of question either, which is a harder question than just how to measure the level of consciousness or intelligence in, in, in the global brain. So in a way, I think progress on building the global brain and nudging it to emerge is going much, much faster than progress on understanding what the global brain is or understanding how to nudge and guide it in, in, in certain directions, right? And that, 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 that's, uh, that's not necessarily a problem, but, it, but it's an interesting, interesting fact to look at anyway. And we, we didn't even get back to the spiritual aspect, which is fine, because that, that's even more of an open question, right? Because I, I mean, I mean that, that would be driven by the consciousness and the nature of consciousness and the level of sort of evolution of the consciousness of this global brain. And we certainly don't know how to measure that. Like We can't even measure intelligence in humans across cultures, let alone measure the degree of like spiritual enlightenment or self-awareness in humans across cultures, right? Let alone in an emerging global global brain system. But I think we could actually make progress on these questions if we as a culture cared as much as we do about like blowing each other up or selling each other stuff, right? But we but we don't collectively care enough. I mean, those in this room do, but the human species doesn't collectively care enough about these things to have put sort of big time effort into them. And so we are where we are, which is a very exciting place to be, but also a very confusing place to be. Hello, hello. Uh, so now uh, there's still a little bit of time to ask questions. I invite people. Hello, thank you so much. Um, I'm Andy Chatburn. I'm a physician and bioethicist in uh, working in healthcare. And I am so interested in pulling on the thread of spirituality that you um, mentioned just briefly about embodied consciousness and especially like how might we how might we coax and be with the consciousness of the trees for instance um, and I'm curious if you have thoughts about ways that we in this room might embody step into our embodied consciousness in a way that coaxes and courts the global brain embodied consciousness across species that's very hard. I mean, I think that the way that technology has developed so far is not oriented that way, right? So, I mean, so I, I, I live in a rural area and I love going outside to the forest and, and, and beach. And that then it's very easy to sort of sink into the consciousness of trees and, and ocean waves and so forth. But then that's like me as a human being in, in, in nature, right? But then when I, when I go inside the house to my study, like I'm sitting in a, um, it's a nice chair, but it's still relatively uncomfortable compared to walking around outside, right? I mean, I mean I'm, sitting, I'm sitting inside, I'm getting RSI, mo 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 moving my fingers, and I'm, I'm staring at some screen that's probably messing with my eyes, talking to people all, 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 all around the world. And, and th then getting that sort of a, communion with the uh, nature and oceanic feeling that you can have one out in nature getting that well like saying they're wiggling your fingers programming in ai is is quite difficult right so it, it's 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 it, se it seems like the the way technology has developed is imbalanced in that way right? like in, in in taoism you have the notion of the upper middle and lower Dantian, so my Mandarin sucks, but like the the, the brain and then the sort of heart and then and then the, then the 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 gut and the the primal body, right? And clearly in that ontology, almost all of our technology is upper Dantian, right? Like it's it's very 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 imbalanced. It's it's all it's all intellect, right? And and that's what is driving the development of the global brain right now. It may not have had to be that way but it, it it certainly is that way and even when you look at like a fitbit or something it's trying to bring the body into it but it's 
a very irritating way. Like you're quantifying how much you move, which who cares about what matters is, I mean, that's, that's just, if you're not able to sense how your own body feels and if you're doing good for yourself, you want some machine to tell you how many steps you took. But that, I mean, the, the fact that you need that number is bad because you should be able to feel if you, if, if you did something healthy already, right? So I, I, I feel like somehow we would need to rethink what kinds of technologies we're making from, from, from the ground up to have it not be purely like upper dantian and over intellectual. Yeah, you could gesture at what that would be. Like we, I mean, wearable computing is a thing, but not that much of a thing, right? So you could, you, you, you can imagine having like low cost sensors in all your clothing that help give you some sort of ambient biofeedback on everything you're doing, but in a in a subtle reactive way, as if it was like a you're expanding your organism that's talking back to you flexibly rather than just giving you a num num number to look at. And of course, neurofeedback could be quite interesting and, and, and subtle also. And you, 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 you could imagine using technology in a way that would help us to feel what each other are feeling better, right? Because I, I can't, I can't, like I have a five-year-old son, I can't sense his body feelings. I can sort of sense it, but I can't really sense it. But you, you can imagine a technology that helped you sense other people's body feelings more and would bring you together better. But yet, that's not the technology that's being actively developed now. And with our current over-intellectual way of doing things, we might have human-level AGI in like five or eight or ten years or something well before we develop th this more balanced sort of connectivity technology. But, I, I, but anyway, to, to, to summarize, I, I would say you would like to have technology that lets us connect with other people across the world, like global brain connections that are less purely intellect oriented and, and more whole being oriented. But I don't see that being too actively developed at, at, at this moment, right? <laughs> I'm Philip Beasley. I'm an artist and an unstable engineer. I, and my, my question asks you to comment on the provocation and opportunity of intelligence tests, which you invoked as an important part of, of, of your presentation, cross-species, cross-disciplinary, the multiple levels of intelligence. I ask because I think of the 1979 movie Being There by Peter Sellers as an example in which apparently degraded intelligence offers something wondrous, imparts the wonder of suffering and curiosity and, and love, and yet suggests that the measures that understand physics are different than the measures that understand metaphysics and different again than the, than the measures that understand Pataphysics, the, the, the province I mean, of irony and I, suffering. I think and reasoning by reference to Hollywood movies is often often flawed, right? So, well, I mean, Sutton Sellers, Sellers was a very generally intelligent guy acting like a stupid well, guy, right? My so, question is about tools and frameworks for yeah, intelligence yeah, so tests. I, I, th I think that I'm very uninterested personally in intelligence tests, but I'm very interested in having a diversity of probes and, and into complex systems to just have a try to make different concise summaries of what's going on inside their states. I mean, wanting these probes to give a rank ordering of systems to me is somewhat beside the point, but being to probe what's going on inside systems is quite interesting. I, and I mean, in, 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 in that light, I, th I, th I think that, of course, Having a lot of thought going on can inhibit you from just experiencing the joy of, of being alive. It doesn't have to, right? You can, you can experience the joy of being alive and have a lot of thought going on. And we don't, we don't have a well understood set of measures or practices rela related to this question, right? Which is partly because we can't measure what's going on in, in, in the brain very well. That's actually an advantage of an AGI system. I mean, a computational system you can measure the execution trace of the programs and you know exactly, you can measure exactly what it's doing. So it might be that having human-like systems in a computer lets you address a lot of this stuff just because you have systems that you can instrument and measure what, what, what they're doing. And again, if, if society cared, we could have built an internet 
where you could, in an anonymous privacy preserving way, you could gather all the dynamical data on the internet and study it, put it out there openly for everyone to study for everyone's good. Instead, most of the data about what happens in the internet is owned privately by big companies and, and, and intelligence agencies so that we're not able to study this and, and understand it as well as we would like to. Uh, let's have the next one. I see that there are more people than we can manage before the, the poll. So I said, well, I'll, I'll give you. No, but I suggest we will continue doing the poll, but whoever wants to have a coffee break in the meantime can walk about. Uh, I suggest we, we have probably five or 10 minutes more for questions. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would make a deal with the questioners, which is if they ask short questions, I will give short answers. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Margo Wixom. I'm an artist and writer who lives here in the Bay Area. My question is, and I've had this question actually since I've been very young as a child, why are we focused so on studying human consciousness when it seems that there's other consciousness that's so much that has had four million years of evolution to be a better intelligence, like the echolocation of bats and whales that are premised on how do we move based on everything around us or the mycelial network that says, how do we move so that we benefit all? So why focus just on human consciousness when the consciousness of other systems seems to be much more intelligent? Well, I, I can answer that one quickly. I mean, I, mean I, I don't think it's at all clear the intelligence of these other systems is, is greater than humans, but we don't have a great measure. But I think the reason we've, that the scientific community is focused on human intelligence is A, we are curious about ourselves and many people are curious how their own mind works and would like to, would like to under, understand that. But also we have better tools for studying ourselves. Like, so I, I tried to study communication among dolphins at one point, about six, seven years ago. We didn't have signal processing tools that could differentiate one dolphin's call from another's in a pool. We could, we, at that point, we couldn't solve the, like, subtracting off for all the echoes to even tell which dolphin was saying what and that would cost a lot of money to develop that whereas for humans we've got all the data of what humans are saying right so it's a we're curious about ourselves and b it's easier to study our, ourselves because we're gathering data about ourselves all the time but I, I i would love i would love to see more data on intelligence and in, in other organisms gathered though i, I mean it right. does seem important yeah I'm Greg Stock from uh, Socratic Sciences. Hey, and we know each other. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. great to see you again, Ben. Yeah, it's been Fabulous a while. It's talk. been a while. Yeah. 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 So you've been doing this for a long time and thinking about AGI. And, and it's a short question. If you were to project forward 50, 100 years, what does it feel like when you imagine, you know, the advances of technology that are going at? How does that impact <laughs> AGI? So I, 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 I think much like our friend Ray Kurzweil and others in the singularitarian vein. I mean, I, I think we're going to get AGI smarter than people within five to 10 years. And I think within a few years after that, we will have machines way, way smarter than, than human beings. And I would rather we were approaching it by a different trajectory than the one that we are, but I still think, I still think we're, we're getting there. Right. And I think that opens up a whole spectrum of possibilities. One of which is like, upload yourself into, into a, a virtual world and become one with the supermind, right? But I don't think that's the only possibility. I think there will be humans living on Earth who no longer have to get old and die, no longer have to become physically or mentally ill, no longer have to work for a living. And then, I, I mean, uh, what social, intellectual, artistic landscapes we're exploring then, I mean, that's a question of cultural evolution as, 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 as much as anything else. Like I, I, would, I could spend a lot of time learning to play every musical instrument and hiking on every trail in the world, right? So I won't be done with that in 50 or 100 years. So there's, there's a lot of time. My name's Wolfgang Leithold. I'm a political scientist and artist at the same time. Just a while ago, I asked Alexa, you probably know, uh, do you ever have doubt? And she would answer, I don't know what you mean. So... I tried again, but never succeeded. So do you think there is room for doubt in the kind of intelligence that is well, located in the global brain? I mean, the first, the first thing I would say is what chatbot systems say 
just reflect some statistical model that they're creating, predicting what a typical human would say to that question. So what a chatbot says when you ask it a question, it's not like it's reflecting the actual thought or situated cognition of, 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 of that system. It, do, it doesn't really mean much. And in terms of doubt, yeah, I mean, certainly to have a system that has real human-like general intelligence, that system will have to have some reflective self-knowledge. It will have to have some level of knowledge of what it knows and what it doesn't know, which is just basic probabilistic reasoning. I mean, a Bayesian network has that, right? And so certainly, certainly doubt at, at some level has to be there for any system with any, any reflective self-understanding. So I, I think, yes, we'll have to doubt itself. Hi, my name is Mariel, and I'm a student, researcher, educator, and artist. And I wanted to ask a more general question that you've touched on, uh, but a little more general version of your answer about Don Chi and the skew towards intellect. Is the role of Chi in the emergence or health of the global brain? And maybe ways we can cultivate it. There's so much we don't know about just the dynamics of the global brain right now and what kind of organism it is and 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 what it's doing right and 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 then the the sense in which each of us can like flow with the global brain as opposed to flowing with the nature or the or the, or the e e ecosystem or, or, or something is is quite quite subtle and and weird and I think we don't we don't understand it like in in a sense that we're bad at consciously understanding we are just flowing along with the global brain right like just like little leaves flowing along in, in, in a river be, being pushed right because I mean we're reading messages all the time we're seeing stuff all the time and we can't help what we think and do being being conditioned by all this and being being more aware of this would be good and would be interesting and is hard. So I think I think I think it, it's it's a great question that none of us knows the answer to, right? Yeah, important thing to reflect on. Hi, I'm Emily Dumore, and I'm a curriculum theorist and a theologian and an artist and a musician. Um, so, in your view, is it a given that there will be one global brain, or is it possible that more than one global brain could emerge? And if it, if more than one emerged would they occupy the same space and well, how would they it share is that It's possible space? that more than one could emerge. It doesn't seem to be what's happening. I mean, even, so if you look in mainland China, I lived in China for 10 years and moved back to the U.S. three years ago. Even in mainland China, given how WeChat is in a way its own cutoff network, I mean, Chinese researchers are posting papers on ArcSci, posting code in, in GitHub, and there's like, 50 to 70 large language models put online by Chinese companies in, in the last year. But I mean, transforming neural nets were invented in, in Google and popularized by OpenAI, right? So it seems like even if you look in China, which is like the most walled off major subset of the world today, there's incredible amounts of, of flow back, back and forth. So it seems like the interlinking is is tremendous and we're not, we're not seeing the emergence of two separate glo global brains, but you, you certainly could though. No? Yeah. That was great. Um, a slightly meta question. Uh, all human beings are kind of good and bad, dark and light. You know, we, we love and we murder. We're the people building out this thing. Uh, the current generation of AIs really try to be good and not evil, but is that even a realistic goal to create a global brain that doesn't have a dark side, that doesn't express our dark side? Is that a beautiful dream or is it a possibility? And is it even desirable to have light without dark? I mean, I, I think that we come back to me not being a good Christian here, right? I mean, <laughs> of course, I was, I was raised Jewish, but I'm non-religious. But I, I mean, I don't know that light versus dark and good versus evil is yeah. such a fundamental or... or useful way to to look, 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 look at things really i mean i would i'd certainly say from the perspective of individual humans i mean the any cultural shift has 
good and bad aspects, right? Just like the shift from Stone Age society to, to modern society has good and bad aspects. So certainly the emergence of the global brain is going to be good and bad for yeah. people depend, depending on, on, on how they look at it. I, I, don't, I don't think you need to have a global brain that's like psychopathic and, and pathological and sadistic and wants yeah. to blow up people for, 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 the, for the hell of it, right? I mean, yeah. you, could, you could get that. I, I, don't, I don't think you, you, you have to have that. Just like you don't have to have a human who wants to like cut themselves and, and chop off their limbs. You yeah. could get that. <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't have to have that, right? So yeah. there will be some blend of yeah. positive and negative. Yeah. I guess you can't avoid that from any complex... Yeah system from any complex perspective. So right? you just but, want to build AIs but, but, but that you, have good chances. <laughs> nevertheless, there are more versus less pathological systems. And we, we can we can try to Great. we can try to build a less pathological system. Good. Right? Okay. <laughs> Give it a good childhood. Yeah. <laughs> Talk, 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 talk loud. It's hard to hear with it. The Hi, um, I'm Jake Duffy. I'm a student at USC. And um, you said that you lived in um, China for 10 years. I grew up in China myself. And my question for you is how... You put, your, put your head by the microphone, although I could just walk over there. Yeah. Um, I grew up in China myself. So my question for you is how is their approach to AI development differ, differ from the US in terms of like regulation, surveillance, and global collaboration? Well, in terms of regulation and surveillance, I mean, I mean, if, if, if those of us in the blockchain world are successful at rolling out an AGI system that is splayed out across servers all over the world, like you get a server farm in Paraguay, you have a server farm in Azerbaijan, you have one in Russia, you have one in US, you have one in Germany, and the AI is running across all these different servers in different places and and plus uh we're, we have a, a device called the hyper ai box that you can you can buy or you will be able to buy soon and put in your house that will run a sort of lobe of, of a distributed a, a, ai system and earn you some tokens along the way right so i mean if the ai is spread out all over the place like that it becomes more challenging to regulate and it becomes more challenging for any single party to control which some people think is bad and some people think is think is, is 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 good right i mean ultimately of course if if your ai gets to human level general intelligence i mean major countries could send their army out to every server farm in everyone's house to confiscate their ai box they could turn off the internet right but it, but it becomes it becomes it becomes harder and harder if you have a decentralized infrastructure and my way of thinking is that's better because i i have more I have more trust in the vast chaotic mass of, of humans than in big companies or, or, or governments. But, but I mean, neither, neither of these is an ideal option, right? <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks.